I support my sons. I support this community. Uh, coal mining is our way of life. I've got four grandkids that goes to this school. My kids went through this school. My husband and his parents went through these schools. None of us are sick. And if you choose to live in West Virginia, this is, this is the best paying job there is. What happens if mountaintop removal goes away? What happens to you and your family in West Virginia? We're so hungry. Let them walk in our shoes for a while. And then, you know, let's see what they have to say. I come from a long line of coal miners. And uh, my father was born in 1915, and he was an underground miner. He didn't think MTR was mining. He thought it was heavy equipment use. You know, I know people are worried about their jobs, but reclaiming the mountains that's already been destroyed, it's going to take years. They're not going to lose their jobs. They have jobs there for a long time. We still have plenty of underground mines, and men haven't been utilized in that function. You know, coal isn't going anywhere. We're going to have coal, but there are alternative functions to use with it that make it a sustainable society. So issues like this, it's not a good thing. You know, I think that uh, the miners are saying they're worried about their jobs. It seems like they're not taking in the information that's being provided. Trying to tell our side of the story, and our side of the story doesn't get told often enough. The media uh, doesn't seem like it wants to tell the truth about our side. It's always the environmental extremist side of the story. So what is your side of the story? Well, our side of the story is the coal mining coal industry provides jobs and if the mountaintop mining is done right, which it is, um, the reclaim, we do a good job on the reclaim, we uh, re replant trees, the, uh, the streams are taken care of. It's not, we're not about raping the mountains, we're just up here trying to make a living for our families. Do you think that they? I mean, they don't. They don't have a point, and they, and they, and they aren't seeing you guys' side of the story. Well, a lot of them don't know our side of the story. They, they're uneducated about it. All they see is the pictures on TV. A, a strip job does look bad, but it don't look any worse than a road construction job. They take the tops of mountains off for road construction, and they reclaim it. We reclaim it too. It's not just a local issue. It. it, it that reverberates throughout the whole country and I think most of the people that I know don't even know that we are doing this, you know. Don't know also that we have uh, solutions available to us now um, that is infinite renewable regenerative energy that doesn't cause black lung or asthma or, you know, poisoned rivers and, and uh, the degraded, uh, and, and, and de degraded environment and, and loss of ecosystems and everything. So, so I'm here to, you know, sort of stand in, in solidarity with those who are fighting mountaintop removal. You're going to be walking today, and I want to say this to you clearly. We're here today because we believe in free speech in this country. Being able to speak up to what we believe is right. And that's what we're doing today. And we are walking for that same reason today. And here's my final word I promise to you today. In the Gospel of Matthew, in the 17th chapter, it says if we have the faith of a mustard seed, a tiny mustard seed, if we have that kind of faith, we can move mountains. Because what we want, we will not have energy at the cost of clean water, at the cost of safe communities, at the cost of situations that put children in danger. I am absolutely honored to be standing here today with y'all to kick off this day of action, to be standing among the people that will end mountaintop removal this year and take back App Appalachia and bring a clean, renewable energy future to this region for everyone.
And to look at this school is to look at everything that is wrong with our energy policy in America today, and we're going to change it. For me to go home is walking distance. What we have here today is a failure to communicate. Because some of us have for so long been drowned out by hecklers, by politicians, by coal influence politicians, by courts. This, and we just had a threat of violence over here. This is how the industry deals with dissent. This is how the industry deals with those who stand up for their rights to protect their homes. We are here to protect our homes, to protect our air, to protect our water supplies, to protect these children who go to school 400 yards from a toxic sludge dam. What I'd like to say is that there's no need, there's no need to destroy our planet in order to power up our future. Um, when I first learned about mountaintop removal, I, my, my jaw hit the floor. I, ne I couldn't believe that in America we actually blow up our mountains and push it into the rivers and the valleys below. It seemed like it should be illegal. There are plans in the works that can provide clean jobs that don't, that don't cause asthma, that don't cause environmental degradation, that don't cause cancer. All right, all right, anyway. Anyway, what I'd like to say is that it's time to move forward to a clean and renewable regenerative energy. It's possible. We have the tools available to us now, and these jobs won't hurt anybody. And I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here to add my voice to all the grassroots organizations that have been fighting for sanity. They're here protesting against us. They need to go back to where they came from. If they're for us, that's good. If they're against us, get out of the state. I do live here, you know, but the problem is there are people that don't live here that are here because the coal that's mined here is mined out of state and it's being burned in power plants that's making their kids sick. So this is America and the coal that's being shipped out of here opens up the fact that people, people from, from other places that are being poisoned can come here and protest this. This, this is everybody's mountains, this is everybody's air, this is everybody's water. This doesn't belong to people that live here. They're supposed to march on the bridge at 1 o'clock to come over and give us demands. We're blocking the bridge. I mean, we're all sticking together.
for the expediency of a dirty energy source. to bring attention to the devastation, devastating effects of mountaintop removal and to, uh, to make a call for clean, renewable, in infinite energy resources, which we have available to us now. Was it worth it, Carol? Absolutely. Is it worth it? No question about it. I have five jobs to start a stack. You go back to Hollywood. of Washington to a problem that they're continuing to ignore. And what's your first and last name? Hanson. I'm Jim Hanson. You're Jim Hanson. Thank you very much. And is it worth it? Well, I think it's worth it, yes. It, it's it's uh, not only something we should do, it's a responsibility to draw attention to the matter and to try to get Washington to pay attention. They can't compromise their way out of this. They've got to realize they've got to phase out coal emissions. And you have to start with mountaintop removal because of all the other things that it does. Mountaintop removal provides only 7% of our coal. We could stop it right now. Thank you, sir. What do you think? Is it worth it? Is this worth it? Yeah, of course it's worth it. It's worth it for all, all our grandchildren and our children and everybody else. We've got to stop burning coal in this country, and we've got to give people other good jobs to do. And there's plenty of jobs that need to be done. We've got to build a whole new energy infrastructure for this country. And if we don't, we're going to have a, a climate chaos, and our kids are going to not thank us for that. And what do you say to the people who say it's none of your business, not don't tell West Virginians how to live? Well, my mother was born in about 50 miles from here in Clay County. But I think it's all of our business anyway, because my children are, are going to use, breathe the same air that these people breathe. Marsh Fork Elementary School has become a symbol in the long-fought battle over mountaintop removal mining. Protesters point to the school as an example of abuse the mining inflicts on local communities. They say the school's proximity to coal operations and the dust and chemicals associated with them put children at risk. State officials say the school is safe. Meanwhile, Massey Energy subsidiary Goals Coal Company is battling state environmental regulators to put a second coal silo near the school. The details are new, but they fit into a larger history of the politics between industry, local communities, and government in the coal fields. Uh, up until the 1960s, late 1960s, uh, co-operations, large business operations, had little accountability in what their environmental choices, um, to some degree, uh, the way they treated workers, at least until the UMW came along. But by the 1960s, that changed dramatically. Uh, locals began to organize. People throughout Appalachia realized they had a common interest, not only in the environment, but um, in their everyday lives, their quality of life. Tear it down! Tear it down! 
The role of outsiders fuels some of the emotion over Marsh Fork Elementary School. Some residents near the school say protesters from outside the community aren't welcome. On the protesting with the school and stuff, I think it's crazy. I mean, the protesters that are in here, they don't live here, so they really don't know what's going on. They're not from here. They come in, they're staying in people's houses, renting them out. They do community work, which that don't bother me either. You know, they're trying to make their living just as well. I know most of them I met is going to college and it's just a summer thing. How have outside interests played, what role have they played in, in protests historically on coal issues? Well, it's, that complaint about outsiders is common. If one looks at the civil rights movement in the South, one of the early complaints when that was taking place was that well, there would be no problems among blacks in the South if it wasn't for college students from the North coming in and stirring these things up. But the spark where these things begin is in that local community. And in Appalachia, and particularly in areas such as this, usually there's not that large of a population in, in these areas, and they need outside help at organizing and, and strengthening their voice. Yes, we have had a lot of outside, or I guess you could call them outside people, coming in to help us with that. A few members of the community fighting government and coal company over an issue such as the safety of their children, you can't do it alone. And I thank God for them coming in and helping us with that. More power to them. We need somebody. If they're outsiders, that's good. While locals are involved in the protest, many in the area around Marsh Fork Elementary School are reluctant to address the issue. Several declined to comment at all, and even fewer agreed to appear on video. Rake says that fits into the historical patterns. In, during protests, the people who are going to take the heat, who, who may be ostracized by um, uh, leadership in a given area, or the folks who live there. And that's, a, that's frightening. That can be frightening. Uh, you may feel safe as long as you have a large group of politically active, but you don't know what's going to happen after they pull out. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's not uncommon. For, for years, one did not dare e even mention unionization uh, it, because they would, be, they would lose their job, they would lose their home, their company home. I mean, it's, uh, there is always in someone's mind, there is the idea that, well, if I, if I take part in this, if I protest what's happening and I try to bring some change and it doesn't work, we lose, then who's left here? Me. What is left now near Marsh Fork Elementary School is a tumultuous debate about loyalties and who belongs in the community. They have no right. If they don't want to be here and other people don't want to be here, move. I mean, to me, that's just the way I feel about it. I choose to live here, but I do not choose to have my grandchildren going into a school that has the potential for danger. I see both of them, you know, and I agree with both of them. I don't think they should have it so close to the school maybe. Then again, a lot of uh, the school fundings come from Massey. I know they done a lot down here in Whitesville with the Whitesville pool and the schools. A lot of these protesters from out of state, a lot of them here in the state, a lot of them I agree with because they're concerned for the kids and things, and they are really concerned about the dust problems and th stuff like it. I mean, I'm not for Massey or against Massey. I know a lot of them that work there. I mean, they're good people. And I feel that if they say it's safe, it should be safe because they have families, you know, kids and stuff. They're not gonna go out there and put their own children in danger. They could stop tearing down our mountains. They could clean up our water. That could clean the air and get out. Near Marsh Fork, there is a sense of resignation that this is just another phase in a long line of conflicts. I wish to hurry up and get up, get it over with, if they're gonna let them put it up or not. That way it probably might stop. But then again, 
Once that gets done and over with, it'll be something else for everybody to pick on, do something else about, protesting about. So. That whole idea of, um, of West Virginians that you can't fight, quote, the big man, uh, is well ingrained, is well ingrained. And, and they don't think they're going to be hurt. Mm -hmm. They don't think, they think that if they, if they don't do something drastic, if, if we don't uh, protest in the Capitol, no one's going to hear us. sixties and, and seventies you had huge caravans of people driving to Charleston to protest strip mining. They knew it was the only way their voice was going to be heard, again because the structure the the, the structure is not there for them to get an immediate voice. I look at it this way, the protesters are doing a good thing in a way, but they're fighting a losing battle, I feel. Myself I feel like they're just fighting a losing battle because of the politicians and the big coal companies and things, they're going to win hands down because the judges and arbitrators are going to go their way. Ralph Gerald is a retired coal miner. He worked for a number of companies, including Massey. But he's cynical about the future of his community because he says so much has already been lost. They've got all this posted. They've got all this posted. As far as you want to go, it's all posted. You go down here, there's guard shacks. You go up here at Ed White, there's guard shacks. You go to Hazy, there's guard shacks. Montcalm Mountain, there's guard shacks. Stickney Mountain, guard shacks. So what's a man do in this area? And we're used to raising gardens, farming, working in the coal mines, and hunting and fishing. That's our life. Professor Rakes is also a former coal miner from neighboring Fayette County. So you mined coal for 20 years before shifting to history. Yes. So how does that, how does just all of this strike you as someone who's worked within the coal industry and then going and studying this academically, ha has it changed the way you think about and talk about coal? Oh, absolutely. Uh, when I worked uh, particularly with Pittston, um, I tended to lean toward production, whatever, uh, given a situation, I would always think of production first. Um, I've been guilty myself of um, stretching things, let's say, uh, it, with sludge ponds, uh, with um, a variety of environmental concerns because I was concerned about production. But now I see it in a much larger context. I grew up hearing that you can't trust coal, the coal companies, uh, but I got a mixed message. The cooperation gives us our livelihood, and we need to work hard for them. But you can't trust them, and it it, it becomes enculturated. So it, I, I see it on a much larger scale now. Uh, I see its impact throughout West Virginia in particular, uh, both for good and, and for bad. Which side are you on, boys? Which side are you on? Which side are you on?